thank you, Erwin, for a, a great introduction and overview of India uh, and its economic uh, environment as well as the business opportunities that, that exist. Now we'll move on to our second speaker. Ned Nedengadi is the Regional Director for Global Expansion for the Business Development Bank of Canada. Ned has 25 years of business and consulting experience guiding SMEs in identifying opportunities to develop and grow in new markets globally. He also helps companies reduce costs by smart sourcing, as well as improve market share and revenues. This certified management consultant's area of expertise includes feasibility studies, market entry strategies, sales management, and international business. He has also owned and operated successful businesses in Europe, the Middle East, and Canada. Let's welcome Ned Nedengadi. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all so much for coming this morning. This light. Uh, well, you need to be by the microphone too, if you can. Oh, man, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, I just want to say that uh, I just want to acknowledge some of my colleagues here from BDC. I see John, Bino, Alan Gauss from the Global Expansion Team. Uh, just to give you a quick recap, first of all, that BDC helps clients go global. We have always provided consulting and financing services to our clients. Uh, but three or four years ago, we decided there was a conscious decision taken by the BDC specifically to help our clients go to India, China, the Middle East, Vietnam, and Brazil, where recognized <laughs> as the primary markets. What I want to do is to address three points. Why, who, and how? So why should one go global? Why should one go to India? We are here, we are talking specifically about India. So why would one have to go to India? And the primary reason is this, that the world has changed. The way businesses are done around the world has completely changed from what it was even five years ago. When talking specifically about India, I want to say one thing. First of all, that anything you hear about India is true. And everything you hear about India is untrue. That is the great paradox that India is. So everything that Erwin has said here is true. But almost everything is also untrue. That is not to say that Erwin's information was wrong. It's simply the paradoxical nature of the country. So when we say there is a look at the quadrilateral highways that connect the country, we also have to keep in mind the thousands of kilometers of unpaved roads that exist. When we say that there is 15 or 13 seaports and there are numerous airports, we also have to understand that most of them are outdated, they are old, and they do not work as it should. What does it mean then to Canadian businesses? What it means is there are two ways of looking at it. One is to say, this country is the pits. The other one is to say, we can help fix it. All of a sudden, every one of those problems become an opportunity for companies who have the wherewithal, the understanding, the technology, and the expertise to make it happen. Therefore, and we are extremely good at it in Canada. If you really look at it, we are very good at healthcare, education, technology, automotive, green technology, recycling, wastewater management, you name it. There are a number of areas where we are extraordinarily good at what we do. Unfortunately, we do not know it. And as Canadians, we do not speak loud enough. Some years ago, at a meeting in India, I was talking to a bunch of people, and I asked, and many of them were carrying Blackberries, and India is one of the largest users of Blackberry, and I said, do you know which country manufactures this? About 70% of these guys, all top executives, said it was an American product. In fact, I'm told that most Americans think that it's an American product. <laughs> and Bombardier, Urban was referring to Bombardier's activity in India, it's huge there in the aircraft industry and the rail. Most people in that room thought that Bombardier was a French company. The second guess was it was an American company, a Canadian company, the, the, the name of Canada didn't come up at all in the discussion. Why? 
because we don't shout loud enough. We don't speak loud enough. And I think time has come for us to take advantage of markets such as India if you really want to grow. Because think of it, we have 33 million people here. We have about 300 million people in the US. So you have a total market capacity of about 400 max. Everybody and their cousin is in that marketplace vying for your business. Why would you want to do that? Why would you not go to a market which is much bigger and better in terms of opportunities? I'll give you a couple of examples of companies that we have helped, both in the consulting side as well as the financing side. Because I'll be remiss to say, not to mention, that BDC also does financing globally. One of, the, one of the big challenges is that most companies, once you know how to get into the market and you start going into these foreign markets, you need money to grow. You need money for your working capital to purchase, whether it's, it, it's, whether it's your planted machinery or warehousing facility, whatever it is. There are organizations such as EDC with whom we work very closely. But fundamentally what happens is the chartered banks here in Canada do not finance your property overseas. The companies in India, the, the banks in India, do not typically finance your venture because you don't have the credibility or the track record there. So you are dependent then on your local partner. BDC does finance it. And I'll give you an example of how they do that as well. So who is the next question? Who should be thinking in terms of India? I suggest that if you are in any one of those areas that we were talking about, if you are in any way, shape, or form related to infrastructure, construction, manufacturing, automotive, healthcare, education, any one of these things, you have huge opportunities. Is this likely to be a very quick experience? I doubt not. I don't think that you can expect to go into India and start raking in the profits the next day. But then I suspect that is not the case even if you were to go from here to Quebec. The only thing is, it is a longer grind. The problem is, in India, when you look at the Indian market, look at it through Indian eyes. Do not look at it through Canadian eyes. Because it is like the old story of the ugly American. You know, everything is quite different from the way we are used to. But that just is the nature of the beast. If you understand it, you will succeed. If you don't, then you fail. Don't expect things to happen as it does here, because it doesn't. The Indian yes has many connotations. So if you ask somebody something and if they say yes, it doesn't necessarily mean yes. It could mean no, it could mean maybe. If someone tells you I'll see, you can always take it as no. <laughs> Let me see. <laughs> we will try. These are things that are used very commonly because by nature, the Indian will never say no because it is impolite to disagree with someone. That's just, that's just the culture. I mean, uh, you might be familiar with namaste. Namaste simply means I see myself in you from the Sanskrit, which means I treat you as God. So if you come into my office, I cannot disagree with my God. I cannot, I cannot be impolite. So they will agree to whatever you say. So I suspect that is where the Indians perfected the art of shaking their head this way but <laughs> saying yes. So that way, you know, every, all, all, you know, all bases are covered. But, but more, more seriously, you, will, you have to understand the culture. Because if you go into a meeting and if you sit in on a meeting, you will find very often that none of the people in the room will disagree with their boss. Not in front of you. Because that is impolite, it's a loss of face, they will not do it. But you, if you are naive enough and say, you know what, everybody agreed with it, you might be completely disillusioned. I had a client, I was sitting in Delhi with a, with a client of ours, and a whole room full of people, he was doing a presentation, an amazing presentation, and everybody was shaking their heads. And anyway, when he came out, he told me, Ned, I think I blew it. I said, why? He said, I don't think they liked it at all. I said, no, I think they loved it. He said, why do you say that? He said, I said, he said, everybody was shaking their heads. I said, that actually says that they like it. I mean, in fact, now he's very, very successfully established in India. This might seem to be inconsequential, but let me assure you, it is of consequence. If you don't understand it, it is trouble. Now, uh, I'll give you two examples of the consulting side <coughs> and the financing side where BDC comes in. What we do is very handheld, custom-made consulting to help companies go into these markets, India, China, Vietnam, the Middle East, 
and so on, and Brazil. And our team of uh, consultants on the global expansion team, we are supported very strongly by our consultant, consulting team as well as our financing team in the bank. As you probably know, BDC is a federal entity. So what we do is typically when we ask companies, initially, we learned it by mistakes too. When we ask someone, are you ready to go global? May, very many of them say, yeah, we would like to uh, share that market. But the question is, are you seriously ready? Do you have the financial resources? Do you have the human resources? Do you have the management bandwidth? Do you have the commitment of the management to make it happen? If you do not have all these things, you have gaps in the process. <coughs> so the first thing we do is we do a readiness assessment for you to find out specifically where those gaps might be. And then, of course, it is up to the client to decide whether they want to go forward or not. So there are milestones throughout the process. The second part of it is to do a very detailed market research and analysis. As Irvin was mentioning earlier on, if you do not know the market that you're going into, if you do not have hard facts, chances are your rate of success might be limited. <coughs> because a lot of it is by hearsay. I know a lot of people who say, look, I know somebody who's got a friend, who's got a friend, who's got a neighbor, whose wife's dog is a good friend and well-connected, <laughs> and they're going to help me get into this market. Trust me, it doesn't happen that way. <coughs> because think of it this way. When somebody is in India, and if he is very well connected, and if he's a very influential business person, chances are he's a busy man. He or she is not going to have the time enough, with the very best of intentions, to take your particular business and put it on top of the list, because they have no skin in the game. So we do that. We do very detailed market research and analysis in identifying what kind of opportunities exist, if any, for your product or your service. Who are your competition? We do a competitive strength analysis. Who is your competition? What kind of market share do they have? What kind of market share can you expect to have in that market? And from that, create a positioning strategy. Which part of India should you ideally be positioned? Are you going to be in the south, the east, the west, the north, and why? Once you decide that, we create an India strategy specific market entry strategy for your product or service for that, for that specific product of yours. But the critical thing in any business, if you want to go into a new market, is that you need to have a good JV partner or a strategic ally in that market. <coughs> the large corporations can afford to go greenfield. They don't need partners very often. But I suggest that small and medium-sized companies have good partnerships in those markets in order to facilitate a lot of the unknowns in every, that every market brings to it. I mean, it's a question of, do you have to go about and do a Google search to figure out where, what TIMS is or who TIMS is, as in Irvin's case, or let somebody else figure that out for you and make your process so much easier? So how do you identify these people? There are more companies who have failed because of wrong partnerships than those who have succeeded. So one of the things we do is we identify and shortlist potential partners or allies in the market for you, for your business. And the entire process is very interactive and where we bring the list of partners, we shortlist them. We set up meetings with the key decision makers of those companies. Because a lot of instances, what happens is you go into a new market, meet somebody in that market, someone comes to the meeting because Pradeep has asked someone, can you do me a favor, go and meet this guy who's coming from India or coming from Canada? Because what it does is you have the wrong people at the table. You need somebody there who's seriously interested in your business and interested in doing business with you and are there for the right reasons. Of course, the decision is eventually up to you how you want to take it forward. Once we identify these people, we travel with them into the market, we sit in on the meetings, and act as your advisors through the entire process. That is our process and mechanism by which uh, we do the entire consulting process. And of course, wherever financing is needed, we do the financing element as well. I'll give you a quick example of the consulting element of this. We are a company here who are manufacturers of forklifts. They manufacture rough terrain, heavy duty, multi-directional forklifts used in infrastructure and all the rest of it. They used to do a lot of exports to different countries almost always reactively. <clears throat> in other words, they did not go into a, into a country in any design uh, or any, with any clear idea as to what they're going to do. It's always against inquiries. They got an RFQ quoted for it, they went out. 
when we met with them, they said, look, we would really like to go into India. We have tried thrice to get into that market and we have failed. They did not have the right kind of partner. They had ported for the military and so on and so forth. Then happened. So when we started talking to them, I said, let's do the research. They said, fine, we did the research. The research showed that India has got construction in every possible form. We have 52,000 kilometers of highways being built in addition to the quadrilateral that Urban was talking about earlier on. 52,000 kilometers of highways. They have 15 new seaports being built, some 40 odd thousand of freight corridor being built. There are 400 new airports being built in addition to refurbishing of every single existing airport in India. The, I mean, there are 3,000 shopping malls being built and being uh, designed for the next five years. <coughs> the numbers are mind boggling. So I said, look, this indicates that there are huge opportunities for anybody who wants to play in the infrastructure sector. You guys are doing it. What you do is forklifts. I think you have a great opportunity. They said, wonderful. The other side of the research showed that India has only 4,000 forklifts. Only 4,000 forklifts, none of them heavy duty, rough terrain, multi-directional. This guy was apoplectic. He wanted to throw me out of his office. He said, your research is rubbish. I said, why? He said, you are telling me that you can offload a 40-foot container of cement by hand? I said, yes. And the only way you're going to believe it is if you travel with me, and I will show it to you. He said, OK. So we traveled to India. I typically arrive in the country a few days before. I was in Calcutta, picked him up at the airport, took him into a construction site about midnight, under floodlights, a 40-foot container of cement was being offloaded by about 60 women on their heads in pants. He was a convert, a believer. He videotaped the whole thing. And we stayed in India for 18 days. He videotaped the entire process. When we came back, that was his presentation to his board of directors. Now they are tied up with one of the top companies in India. And the people who were buying for the business, now this was the other part. You need to have good JV partners. You cannot always have Tata's and Birla's and big companies as your partner if you're a small or medium-sized company. But in this particular instance, the eight companies that we shortlisted were all the majors. And he, he couldn't understand why. He said, why would Tata, as a multi-billion dollar conglomerate, want to you know, do business with us? We are a small company. I said, look, yours are big ticket items. There is, you need a partner who has got the credibility, who has got the traction, who has got the connectivity, who understands and has the intelligence of the market today and has the connectivity enough to understand what is going to happen five years from now. If you don't have it, you will not succeed. You cannot afford to have a partnership with somebody who is too small. In the end, it was Tata's and Godrej and another company who were buying for the business and they have tied up with one of them. They are now beginning to manufacture in India to supply India. It's a great success story. The other part of it is the financing element. We have a company out of Montreal. They are in the spices business. They've been importing spices from India for a long time. This is a, this is a, a Quebecois company. They've been in the business for a long time. They wanted to vertically integrate the business. They wanted to go directly to the source, so which we did. Now he's sourcing directly from India. But the big challenge was, how do you control quality? How do you do the labeling? So they decided that the best thing for them to do would be to set up their own facility in India. They identified a place and ran into problems because they couldn't get money. Not from the Indian banks, not from our charter banks. So I'm very glad to say BDC actually financed them, I think $650,000. Now they have a factory outside of Delhi. They source the product in India, the spices. They process, label, and package in India. They compete with the Indians in the Indian market and bring the rest of it back home. Now, that is a tremendous success story. There are lots of success stories. The thing what I'm trying to bring to you is, look, if you are looking at India, if you are looking at expanding your business, talk to us. Because I believe we can help you. I will leave you with this. If you want to walk fast, walk alone. But if you want to walk far, walk together. Thank you very much.